So the key text that we are looking at uh, in this series is 1 Peter 1 verse 8. You love him though you have not seen him. It's the, it's the verse that we're going to keep on coming back to as we explore what it is to fix our eyes on Jesus. You love him though you have not seen him. Well, in the next passage of Thomas Vincent's book, The True Christian's Love to the Unseen Christ, he begins to unpack the wider kind of context of 1 Peter 1, 1.8, uh, looking at the whole of the first chapter. And in particular, he focuses on the second verse, where Peter says that he is writing to, he writes, those who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. As Vincent points out, the people who love Christ, though they have not seen him, are all of those people who are included in that description. And this is true of us now as people who today love Christ, even though we have not seen him. Uh, we too share in the characteristics of this passage, all the things that are made true because of Jesus. First of all, uh, they and we are elect. We are chosen from all eternity by God's will, according to his own purpose and grace to be his people. You and I are elect. It's not something that we have done. It's not because we've been particularly charming towards the law or anything. In fact, we have no real reason for understanding why God has chosen to us. Apart from it is his own purpose and choice that he has made us his people. He has chosen us, he's made us elect, to glorify him on earth and in heaven. So we are, first of all, we are elect. Secondly, as the people of God, as those who love Christ, we are sanctified. We're sanctified. Being sanctified means that we are separated from the world for God's use and purpose. And as uh, Vincent points out here, when we are sanctified, well, that isn't something that's happened to us in part. No, it's something that happens to us completely in the fullness of our being, our, our understandings are set apart for the Lord. Our wills are now inclined to a God in a way that before they never would or could have been. Our souls are sanctified. Our affections, our desires, our wants, our needs are all set apart by and for and to God. And not just all of these things internally, but as Vincent makes clear time and again, our bodies are also sanctified. They are become instruments of righteousness. All of us is sanctified. Thirdly, uh, those who love Christ are cleansed. We are cleansed from the defilement of sin. We are made clean and pure in a way that before we never were. And lastly, and this last word I love is, that the last thing is we are adorned, he says. We are adorned with all sanctifying graces. You and I are adorned. We are beautified by God. We are made beautiful in God's eye and fit for his use. Through all of these things, we are set apart for obedience, to be used by God. These are all the gifts that we have been given as Christians. But all and all these things are, are now the reality of our lives as those who have turned to Christ. They're things that have become true for you and for me. But all of these gifts flow to us from Christ through his work. All of these things that are now true, they've, they've come to us from Jesus Christ, the one whom none of us have beheld with our own eyes. Now, as Thomas Vincent points out, that doesn't mean we haven't caught glimpses along the way 
of of Jesus. Uh, he sa- as he says, you know, we 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 may have seen Christ represented through the sacrament as we take communion, but we haven't seen his person. Uh, we, we may well have seen his image in other Christians as we look around uh, and encounter other Christians, people in the church, but we haven't seen the original from whom it was drawn. We may even have made the trip to Judea. We may have retraced Jesus's footsteps to where he walked on earth. But none of us have beheld him in his glory. But despite that, despite the fact that we haven't seen Jesus, this love that we have nonetheless is, is real. It is true. Uh, it may not be the product of, of, of any of those things, of, of actually setting our eyes on him, but we do have a real love for Jesus. Well, what is this love that we have for Christ? Uh, four things. Firstly, this love that we bear for Jesus, that we experience, is, is wrought by the Spirit. He says, it is a fire which is kindled by the breath of the Lord whose essence is love. This love that we have for Jesus is is not something natural. It's not something we ourselves have generated or manufactured. We love Jesus because this is a work of God to make this so. We love Jesus by grace. It is a gift to us, this love that we have for him. Secondly, this love that we have for Jesus is is grounded, is grounded in the discovery that Jesus is worthy of love. Each one of us who's come to Christ has discovered that he and he alone is worthy of our love, our love beyond anything else that we might want to love. Thirdly, our love for Jesus is given momentum. This love uh, doesn't just exist, it's not just grounded, it doesn't just stay fixed in one place though. It, it also drives us forward. It drives us forward. It drives us forward not to just settle and be content with where we are. It drives us forward to desire becoming united with Jesus. Our love for him has and is given momentum. And lastly, the love that we have for Jesus leads us to give, leads us to give ourselves to the one whom we love. It leads us to place ourselves at his disposal. As he says, lovers give themselves to those whom they love. This is the love that uh, we are given for Jesus. And so he asked, well, what should this love look like? How should this love be expressed by Christ, if, uh, by, by Christians, if, if this is all things that are true? And he names four things again. Firstly, our love for Jesus should be marked by sincerity. As he points out, it was the great sin of, of Judah that she turned not to the Lord with her whole heart. Love, love shouldn't just be something on the surface, it should be from the heart. This love that we bear Christ should be for him self, uh, not just for what we get from him. We need to manifest a love that is sincere from the heart. Secondly, this love for Christ must be marked by supremacy. Christ has to take the highest seat in our affections. As Jesus says himself in Matthew 10, 37, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. As Thomas Vincent points out, well, yes, of course we should love sons, daughters, uh, our partners, friends. We should even love enemies. We ought to do so. We ought to love each of these. But all of these loves should be subordinate to our love 
for Christ. He must have the supremacy in our loves. Thirdly, he says our, our love should be marked by ardency. Luke 24, 32. Did our hearts not burn within us while he talked with us by the way? The disciples ask. Did our hearts not burn with others within us? He says our, our love for Jesus should be strong. It should be ardent. It should be strong enough that it cannot be uh, drowned or washed away or overwhelmed in time of trial and temptation. And lastly, our love for Jesus should be constant, should be marked by constancy. Having begun to love Jesus, we should continue to love him and love him to the very end. What do we make of all of this? Firstly, well, it's just dizzying, isn't it? It's just dizzying. All that has become true for us because of Jesus Christ. There's no, there's no half measures, is there, in what Christ has done for us. And there's also no half measures in what is required of us as well. But we might want to ask, well, why, why would we want to settle for any less? Why would we want our affections for Christ to be any less than that he should have our whole hearts of course you could read this as as condemnatory all that's being said here thinking well we we just don't measure up we can't love christ to that extent that's just too much isn't it well remember though all of the love that we are given is a gift from the father by the spirit to us the love we feel for christ is is not our own we're not called to generate it ourselves we come instead to the Father to ask that he might birth this love in our hearts for Jesus. I'd like to invite you to think about those four words that we were given at the beginning. As a Christian, you are elect, you are sanctified, you are cleansed, you are adorned, made beautiful. Which word out of those four makes you rejoice the most? Elect, sanctified, cleansed, adorned. Which word do you rejoice in the most as you hear those words spoken over you? And also you might want to ponder well, which word do you struggle to believe the most is true about you? Which one do you struggle with the most? Then let me invite you to think about those other four words, those other uh, four words that are marks of our love for Jesus. Our love for Jesus should be marked by sincerity, supremacy, ardency, constancy. Are these words that you would use to characterise your love for Christ? And let me ask you to think, well, what might help you grow in these areas? that you might be able to use these words about the love that you have for him. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for Jesus, for the grace we are given to love him, to be able to behold him as he truly is. Lord, we thank you for the gifts given to us by his hand, even more so, though, may we love the hands that give us those gifts. Father, refine our love for him so that it may be marked by sincerity, supremacy, ardency and constancy. In his name we pray. Amen. Go in peace, everybody.